Thank you. Yeah, so um, I would like to talk to, you about, talk to you about something that developers don't care about. Uh, last year at KubeCon in Seattle, I overheard this quote, uh, developers don't care about RPC frameworks, and yet you're all here. Um, well, of course, we're infrastructure developers, so we have to care. And also, it's always interesting to talk about the, like, the nitty-gritty details of technology. So, um, and the, uh, what also happens is that those kind of fundamental things, they kind of leak out and, and, and the abstraction breaks. So we do have to care in the end. So I would like to talk about that a bit. Um, my name is Matthias, and I work at Spotify. I work as an engineering manager in the infrastructure group. And uh, in that group, we try to migrate the, uh, the, comp uh, the organization from, from something else to gRPC. Um, as a manager by trade and engineer by heart, I, I love to, to work in the intersection between technology and leadership. So at, in that talk, I'll talk about those two things. Because it's not only technically challenging to move everything over to gRPC, it's also a big cultural change that has to happen, and that's, that's where leadership comes in. Yeah, so why are we adopting gRPC at Spotify? There's really, a, the first half of the talk, I'm going to talk about why exactly we're doing that, and then the second one about how we're going about it. Uh, so the why really is two, has two parts. Why do we need to change from what we have today, and why gRPC? So why are we changing? Why do we need to change whatever we have today? So <clears throat> today, uh, a little bit about our infrastructure. We at Spotify, we serve quite a lot of uh, people wanting to listen to music or audio. And um, we have a lot of services that interact with each other in the back end. Um, at the time of, I wrote those slides, there were about 2,500 services interacting with each other. We do handle a lot of, a lot of uh, requests coming into our ingress, and um, we also have, we are a lot of developers working on it, right? Uh, the backend is mostly written in Java and Python, and um, for intercommunication between the services, we actually have our own protocol. It's called Hermes. Uh, it's actually not that Hermes. I thought it was, but it's not Futurama's Hermes. It's a Greek god, Hermes. And it's, like, it's named after the Greek god uh, that is the emissary and messenger of gods. Uh, it's also, uh, funnily enough, Hermes is also the Greek god for the divine trickster. And uh, where we are right now at Spotify with Hermes, our own homegrown protocol and uh, technology, we feel a little bit tricked. A lot of our own kind of uh, homegrown solutions are actually all, uh, called, uh, named after Greek gods. So you might have heard about us talking about Helios, our, our container orchestration system, about Apollo, our service uh, framework, and so on. But we're not going to talk about that. Um, Hermes was started in 2012, was initially based on C CRMQ. The framing was based on CRMQ. Um, it's, the payload is either Chason, Chason or Protobuf. And um, it's actually not an RPC framework. It's just a protocol. So it's, maybe it's easier to compare to it with HTTP. And um, the good thing with Hermes is it works. And we've been using Hermes throughout our backend f since then. And I hope many of you use Spotify and you're able to listen to music. So that's a testament to that Hermes actually works. So why, are we ch why do we need to change? The th problem is not Hermes in itself, the technology. The problem is that it, the fact that it's our own thing that nobody else knows about slows us down in multiple ways. First of all, if, so at Spotify, we, we constantly hire new people. If you join Spotify, you need to learn about Hermes. We can't assume that people know about Hermes joining Spotify. Well, could they? It's also we shouldn't be in the business of creating protocols and as something as fundamental as an RPC kind of technology at a company like Spotify. That's a reason why we moved to the cloud, because we want, don't want to build data centers. And that's likewise with protocols. Uh, it's, it's, it, it 
forces us to write a lot of boilerplate and kind of repetitive code. And there's another aspect, and that's the Hermes ecosystem. The Hermes ecosystem doesn't exist. But how could it, right? So you want to use a load balancer? Sorry, it doesn't exist. Do you use Nginx? Nope. Every, the common denominator for everything is TCP, and that doesn't get you that far, especially now that we start talking about it, service meshes and things like that. The same is also with tooling. So you want to do, debug your API? Well, you have to first write the debug tools to do that. So we have a whole bunch of things that are specific to Hermes. We have instead of curl, we have jcurl. We, actually, we jhurl, I mean, hurl for H, the H for Hermes. And, and that slows you down, and it feels like, why are we, why, are we, why do we have to do, deal with this? So Hermes as a protocol works, but nothing exists around it, and that's in the end why we need to move. Okay. It's the, in overall, that's like our m shift from our own solutions, home, homegrown things, into adopting free and open source software. And if you want to know more about that, uh, there was going to be a talk about more of that today by Jim in the afternoon at the KubeCon. And also, there's going to be a talk tomorrow about a little bit more about Hermes and why you move for the gRPC by Austin and Dave tomorrow. Both of them, all of them are from Spotify, of course. Um, OK. So now we know why we need to move why gRPC. There's a lot of factors or pull factors that, want, that make us want to use gRPC, right? It's open. That's already a better, better than what we have now. It's a open source. It's performant. It's based on HTTP2, so there's a lot of standards that we can rely on. It's backed by CNCF, which gives us some kind of confidence that it's going to stick around for a while. Also, it's used by a lot of heavyweight, heavyweights in the industry already. That's also a good testament. It's strongly typed, which is nice. And there's a, a slew of other features that really want, make us want to use gRPC. Um, I would like to talk about three area, focus, uh, feature areas that, that really make a good case that excite us about gRPC and that made us, convinced us to, to, to go all in. The first one is about the proto, proto buff definition files. Um, I mean, if you've, used with, if you've worked with gRPC, the proto file itself is kind of the holy grail. It's, that's where you define your API as one, one source. You define your API and also your message kind of format. Um, and from that, you can generate code in multiple different languages. So I think at the time of writing, there's a lot of different languages supported by gRPC core. Um, it also gives you kind of this single point of, uh, this, this single source of truth for your API and your service, right? That's the only thing you really have to share with others in order for them to know exactly how to call your service and what to expect back. We didn't have that before. Uh, and many of you, uh, w previously I worked different companies who use HTTP REST, that doesn't really exist either, right? You have to write a lot of JSON boilerplate and deserialization and serialization code, and it always breaks. You have to deal, it's kind of a constant pain. Sure, there's schemas for those JSON payloads, but it's not the same. A um, th few things we learned once we started adopting gRPC is, okay, how do we handle those Protofiles. If given that they are those central source of truth, what do we do with them? Um, the first challenge we had is kind of convince people that they should embrace uh, those proto-definition files. Because we were so used into kind of distributing client chars, uh, client implementations for our services to different consumers, uh, or also just considering our API as kind of a wire protocol. So we, we constantly have to convince people that, wait, the protofile, that's your first class citizen, and from there, everything can be generated. So don't, we, initially we went into uh, this, I, we had that work planned out. We would basically write our own schema registry, and we would generate char files for you, and Python, like client, client libraries, and everything, everything automatically. But in the end, we realized nobody else is doing it, so maybe we shouldn't either. Otherwise, we're just going to be in a Spotify Hermes land, which is not much better than Hermes. Um, once you have that protofile, you want to share it. 
uh, we don't have monorepos. Uh, we don't have a monorepo like others do. So what do you do with protofiles? Uh, I think the best approach for now that we have, and a lot of other people do, is we have a shared repository where everybody, every service owners puts their protofile. And from there, you pull the files that you need uh, to, to, to properly gen to generate the client code that you need to call that service. And on top of that repo, you can write tooling, right? So we have a tool that helps you download the protofiles and dependencies. Uh, also, this is also the place where you can enforce guidelines on how you write protofiles. So it, in our case, if you want to submit your protofile for your new shiny service, you create a pull request, and kind of the, 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 the CI pipeline is, does linting and, and additional checks before it actually can be merged. So that's where you can enforce kind of central policies around API design. Actually, a quick shout out, Uber has a nice tool to handle old proto files. It's called the Proto Tool that we heavily rely on. And we have our own tool that we, it's called Proto Man, that we're looking into how we, if we should just merge our stuff into Proto Tool. But that's, uh, and we do that in the open, though that's a change. Cool. Um, and then the third thing that we learned is versioning. Just don't do it. As in, of course you're going to have versions, but don't try to version control. Uh, don't try to uh, don't try to kind of distribute different protofiles with different versions in their file name or anything like that, or in your client implementation. Just rely on the protobuf being backwards compatible. If you need to do breaking changes, you create a new package, a proto package. So the example here, let's say we have a playlist service, the exposive service with a V1 version, that's the major version. If they need to do breaking changes, they'll just introduce a new, a new version, V2. And if you're not f comfortable with actually publishing it and kind of setting that version st strictly, call it beta 1 and follow that pattern, which many others do as well. OK. So. Uh, a few features that, uh, another feature I would like to talk about is, is around resiliency, and gRPC has a really nice features there, uh, different patterns that you can in, in enforce. So the first one is retries. Uh, in Hermes, for instance, we don't have automatic retries. You don't have that in general HTTP client uh, libraries either. Uh, <clears throat> in the world of Herm gRPC, you can do retries in, in interceptors. Interceptors kind of think middleware, um, and you can then, kind of just configure how your client should be behaving if the server is not responding. And you can do that just through configuration, and it's very transparent to the application. There is actually a proposal ongoing to kind of get that work into the gRPC core. And, um, and one of those aspects in, in the proposal is hedging, which is an advanced way of retries. So hedging means it's also referred to, you might, uh, backup requests is what, what's called in the Cassandra land, or people um, also refer to it as speculate, speculative retries. So the idea, is, the idea is you send the first request, and after a certain delay, if you don't get a response, you set the second request, and after the delay, you set the third request, basically fanning out your requests to all the backends uh, until you get some response. As soon as you get a response, everything is canceled. Every, every outstanding RPC is canceled. So this helps you to kind of cut the tail latency uh, drastically in, in certain cases. The problem, the downside is, of course, that you're going to spend more resources on, GR, on, on RPC. And that's a really a great way to kind of create cascading failures. And that's where what you end up is kind of a thundering herd, herd kind of situation, right? Where everybody hammers the same backend that's already down and yeah, you know, it's really hard to get out of it. So to prevent those cascading failures, gRPC has other features that help you. Uh, we talked about two things. One of them is called retry throttling and pushback. Uh, they're also part of the same uh, proposal. So our, uh, retry throttling basically means you have, a, you have a bucket of retries that you can use, and if they're used up, you, you can't use anymore. So the, the hedging, for instance, won't issue more RPCs if, if you only used up your retry bucket quota. Pushback is on the server side, so the server can actually signal to clients to say, like, wait, hold on, re send me a request in, in a set amount of time again and try it again. 
So it's kind of a way to, to, to create, uh, um, to propagate, uh, uh, yeah, I, I lost, I forgot about the term. Anyway, um, those are good two ways to kind of prevent cascading failures. Um, okay, a, third, a second thing that we like about uh, in, in GRPC, and that's is, is deadlines. So instead of setting time lights, time, timeouts uh, manually, you can define a deadline on a request, and the request will be automatically canceled once the deadline uh, runs out. So um, an example, we have a, an ingress service calling out to a metadata kind of front end proxy and that one calls out to a data uh, to a store. Uh, and in the reach request, we can set a deadline. Um, and throughout the cha call chain, you're probably going to have tighter deadlines the further go you go into the back end. And if something in the very back in the storage, for instance, fails or takes too long time, we can cancel the whole chain. And that, since that's part of the gRPC core, we don't need to build that in all our clients everywhere, and that slims down the boilerplate. And another advantage is that since we are in Google Cloud, so since many of the managed solutions in Google, for instance, and other providers as well use gRPC, we can actually use the same kind of uh, way to call out into GCP. Let's say we connect to Bigtable. So we can use deadlines there as well and can enforce it the same way. Also, we're looking into how we can extend that the other way into the edge. So we're looking at how, if, if we should use gRPC in the mobile client, for instance, and that will give us a lot of benefits, of course, because it's a common RPC. In terms of deadlines, we could actually do deadlines through the whole uh, chain. There's a lot of work going on in there. It's also in, in GRPC web world. Um, that's not uh, something I'm going to talk about more about, but it's, if you're interested, look up GRPC web. It's a very interesting project. OK, another thing I would like to talk quickly about is load balancing and routing, where GRPC brings a lot of, uh, a lot of features to the, uh, um, Traditionally, you will have server-side load balancing. You have a proxy and that all the requests go through, and the, kind of the proxy, the server, distributes traffic in the back, through the back end. The problem with that, well, it's, it's, it's very simple. The advantage is the clients are very, you don't have to care about load balancing at all. The problem is it, you get a latency hit because you have an extra hop. That might be a problem, might be, maybe not. Um, on the client side, we don't have any proxies. You have kind of thick clients that do all the load, 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 um, load balancing logic in the client. Uh, the advantage is you don't have any extra hop. The disadvantage is you have a, a complex clients. Remember, we use Hermes, so there is no load balancer for Hermes. So everything we do at Spotify is client-side load balancing today with Hermes. Um, and we actually have a quite uh, sophisticated uh, policy. We, we, we use expected latency selectors which is not today available in gRPC, but it gives us pretty good load balancing across the back end, and we don't have this extra hop everywhere. Now, gRPC introduces another kind of load balancing. It's called the look-aside load balancing. It's fairly new. Um, the idea isn't that new, but it's, it, I haven't seen many implementations of it yet. But the idea is here that you get the benefit of, you basically do client-side load balancing, but the logic of load balancing the client you extract that into a central uh, load balancer. That's not part of the data plane. So you're not going to have the extra hop. The load balancer sits to the side. I think I have an image. Yes. It sits to the side and basically just feeds the client with updated lists of healthy backends, upstreams. It also, at the same time, consider, of course, monitors the backend and sees which services and endpoints are healthy or not. That's also the w perfect place where you could introduce advanced routing or uh, rollout strategies. And if you squint hard enough a bit and consider that this is all just we extract logic from the client, from the data plane into a central place, it suddenly looks very much like a service mesh. Because what the look aside load balance really is, is just a control plane for the gRPC clients. So, there is currently very early work ongoing on actually uh, supporting the XDS um, routing API from Envoy in gRPC. So you could actually, in the future sometime, maybe use a control plane like Istio to control your gRPC mesh. So you will actually have a mesh that's proxyless, 
and can do at least a subset of what a full-blown proxy word service mesh could do for you. So that's, I think, is very exciting. Nothing that's available today, and we don't use it currently, but I think that's something that we are definitely looking into, if you could help us. Okay. There's one more reason why gRPC is great. gRPC has by far the best mascot. <laughs> the mascot's name is Pancakes, for those who haven't heard about it, and Pancakes because gRPC is the acronym for Golden Retriever Pancakes. And I think if you have that kind of mascot, you don't mu need much more reason to, to adopt gRPC. There's more versions of the same mascot logo to Protoc and Serve. Protoc is the Proto compiler. I love it. And uh, thanks to a colleague of mine and work, actually, and, and, and help from Google, we have our own Spotify Pancakes logo. So if, if you would see, that's what I have on the one single la stick I have on my laptop. Uh, we have a limited amount of, amount of stickers, so if you're interested in that sticker, come talk to me afterwards. Cool. How are we going about it? How do we migrate to gRPC? Because something as fundamental as changing a protocol is a lot of work, right? And we have to consider that everybody at Spotify, all the developers, they have a lot of important things to do, right? They need to kind of deliver value to the customer. If you would be, I hope many of you are customers of Spotify, you shouldn't care that we use gRPC or not. But yet, internally, we feel like we need to do that, that change. So how do we go about that? Because at Spotify, or maybe across the industry, nobody likes migrations. Uh, we have, right now, we're in the middle of another big migration that my colleague David talked about this morning at Keynote. We migrate everything to Kubernetes. Um, well, the first thing is we have to I mean, embrace the fact that this is a journey, right? This is going to take time. And what we're really doing is we're not necessarily moving just to gRPC. We just move to, oh, sorry. So right now we are 10% migration. We have 10% of our services use gRPC. Uh, a half a year ago, we were around a little bit more than zero. So we already made some headway. And what we really want to achieve, the destination is not just gRPC. We want to get rid of Hermes, because that's one of the big point points. But we also really like to encourage people to use gRPC, because there's, there's a lot of benefits to it. So yes, how do we do that? And in order to do, talk, talk a little bit about how we get the teams to that migration, because we, don't, we can't force anyone at Spotify to do those things. Um, we, we kind of pride ourselves that, and say that we have autonomous teams. So how do we get autonomous teams to kind of f want to migrate to gRPC? How do we get them to join the journey? Before, uh, I think I need to talk a little bit about what that entails, because a, a big migration like that is a, is a big kind of a change, a technical change, but also cultural and organizational change. And change is hard. Change is hard because it threatens what you find is familiar, and it's kind of challenges what you're just already had maybe planned, and that change kind of uh, breaks your expectations. And familiar things feel nice and comfortable, right? So how do we build that momentum to, to move in the right direction? And um, how do we convince people to move or migrate in the, on their own free will? Uh, unfortunately, we're not Jedis. We can't use mind tricks. So we employ three different strategies. Um, so the first one I would like to talk about is uh, I would need to first di dive a little bit in what it means to have autonomous teams. First of all, you kind of need a culture of trust in order to, to have autonomous teams. We trust engineers to do the right thing. We empower them. And giving them access, let's say, to the production environment, to and telling them by that that we know that you will act in the best interest of the company empowers them to do the right choice, right? So what we need to do, we don't just tell them, use gRPC. We need to tell them, well, we have to explain to them why this makes sense. Um, and even if something goes wrong, we don't want to blame anyone. We have to kind of see that as a learning opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing when you talk about autonomous teams is autonomy is not freedom, but it's very often perceived like that. It's not, the idea isn't that everybody can do whatever they want. The idea is that you align, you align around your autonomy. 
And I think that diagram shows that very nicely. If you, if you look at autonomy on, on the horizontal and alignment on, on the vertical, what you want to, you want to end up in the, in the corner to the top left, uh, top right, where we have high alignment and high autonomy. If you just have autonomous teams without alignment, they just everybody does whatever they want and we don't get anywhere. If we have high alignment but no autonomy, people just do what they're told top down, which is not very empowering and it's hard to scale. And well, if we have low autonomy and low alignment, I don't know what that looks like. <clears throat> so what we really need is aligned autonomy. And how do we achieve alignment? Um, we do it in multiple ways. One of those is that we make what we, we, we have, in order to get alignment around tech, we have something what we call the, the golden stack, uh, the golden path at Spotify. Basically, the golden path is like a document that helps you, that tells you um, if you follow these kind of practices and you use those technologies, things will be laid out for you. Kind of, it's the path of least resistance. It all points, to, and now you just, that's a screenshot of our, our developer portal internal where the different disciplines have their own golden path. And it's kind of, if you see, you can think of it as a blessed stack, but you're not forced to walk the golden path. If you don't, though, it's probably not going to be as easy as it could be. And hopefully somebody will have, hold you accountable that why are you, why are not using the golden path if it would speed you up X times. So um, what we really do is this, we make the right choice to be the easy, natural, obvious choice for people to take. So the first thing we did, or we're doing right now, is adding gRPC to the golden path and removing Hermes from it. So that this is a clear signal to everyone that from now on, if you use gRPC, we will do everything in our power to make it as easy as possible for you. If you're not in the golden path, you might need to do some extra work. So that's one way. Second thing is we need carrots, right? We need incentives for people to want to switch. Carrots can be things like we address pain points, or it can be features that they're looking forward to, or it can just be overall improved in performance, or because they are attending KubeCon and CloudNativeCon and think gRPC is cool. So this is really an exercise of gamification. And, um, and again, if you remember Hermes, there is no ecosystem. So pretty much everything out there is a good incentive to, to switch. So, and in a case of emergency, if you feel like you're not getting anywhere and you have this long tail of migration and we just end up with yet another protocol, which you definitely want to avoid, we want to have kind of finalized the migration in the end, you have the counterpart to the carrot, which is the stick. The stick, of course, we haven't used that much, and we haven't actually used. Uh, it couldn't look like you set arbitrary deadlines. You say, OK, Hermes will be end of life by, I don't know, December 2020 or June 2019 to kind of for force people to migrate. We really don't want to do that, but I mean, it's one tool that we have in case we have to. It's really if the migration takes long enough, you kind of force it. So right now, we are just starting our journey. We've did a lot of pre-work to kind of get off the ground. We hope now that the flight is going to be smooth sailing. And we hope it's not going to look like that once we land. And we hope that most of our developers didn't have to care that much about gRPC, just that they have a new RPC in general. So I would like to change this that developers don't care about the RPC technologies to developers that don't have to care about RPC technologies. They can, because many do, but it should really be something that you don't have to care. Thank you. <laughs>